Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. In the previous video I showed you my new beige AMD Athlon 64 computer, one of the three computers that I picked up for 30 euros and I just wanted to go through the process of setting up this machine for a Windows 98 retro gaming rig. That's right, Windows 98. I'm not gonna go for Windows XP because I wanted to see how a computer like this, which is fairly cheap, does fare as a Windows 98 gaming machine. But before I do that, I do wanna show you real quick the two other PCs that I picked up. For example, here, this Antec uh, Tower which you know is really really heavy and it's not because of what is inside as you will see here it has this nice little hinge to open up the side panel but it's a really you know heavy metallic case there's very little plastic in here so let's see what we have inside obviously we have the intel pentium 4 cooler here and three expansion cards we also seem to have two ide hard drives as well as two optical drives now the motherboard that we have here is an Intel desktop board D875PBZ. Something we're going to be looking at in a lot more detail in a next video. So yeah, let's just start her up and see what she does, if she does anything. And I guess she does because I do hear the beep and I do hear or see the monitor coming to life with the Intel Pentium 4 splash screen. So this is an Intel desktop board with an Intel Pentium 4. So let's take a closer look. Memory error was detected. CMOS checksum bad. Oh, oh, oh. But let's continue with the boot and see what she does. And as expected, we do have Windows XP installed on this machine. It appears to be a rather clean installation with an empty desktop. But as the goal is to see if this would become a capable Windows 98 retro machine, we're probably just going to be scratching this installation and go with Windows 98 instead. Now a quick look at the expansion cards that we have installed here. So again, the Pentium CPU cooler is pretty recognizable for the Pentium 4, but let's start with this graphics card here, which is in the AGP slot. So I'm just going to be unscrewing that and see what we have. Seems to be a rather low cost uh, video card, low end. Judging by the color, probably ATI. So yeah, this is probably a Radeon 9200 series. So yeah, everything that doesn't have an active cooler basically is to be considered fairly low end. But for our particular use case, which is kind of a Windows 98 retro machine, which is able to play games from you know 1997, 98, 99 into early 2000, it might just be sufficient we have a second expansion card here which is in the pci slot and appears to be a pci usb controller giving us four additional usb ports and then finally we have a sound card which is also in a pci slot because this machine doesn't have any isa slots and this is your Typical model CT4810 creative sound blaster card. On to the next one, which is this A Open Tower AMD 64 Athlon with the A Open sticker. Here we have the power supply. I don't think this is the original one, standard IO panel, and a separate video card with a DVI output. So let's open up the panel here. And what we seem to be having is an Athlon XP based system. So not really an Athlon 64. This is a gigabyte motherboard. We have one expansion card, which is the graphics card. We have a Trust 520 watt Pro PSU, two IDE hard drives and two optical drives again something that was very standard for these early 2000 machines 
Uh, this is a Gigabyte GA7N400E motherboard, Athlon XP. I'm going to do a separate video on these two machines to explore the hardware in more detail. For the moment, I'm just going to take a quick look at the graphics card. Now, green graphic cards from that era typically indicate NVIDIA, although ATI also made uh, video cards or brands did have ATI based video cards with green PCBs as is the case for this one So here we have an ATI. I think this is a 9100 series So I'm gonna have to check that out in more detail in a next video So for now, I'm just going to see if the computer still boots and what are the specs. So let's turn it on and see what we will get on the display, if anything. The monitor is already lighting up, and what we are seeing is not an AMD 64, but an AMD Athlon XP 1800 Plus. Now, what we're also seeing and hearing from this noisy exhaust fan is that somebody was brave enough to install Windows 7 on this machine. Now, I wouldn't recommend installing Windows 7 on an Athlon XP unless you are very patient, but somebody went to the trouble of doing just that. So yeah, we're probably not going to keep Windows 7 on this machine, but like I said, I'm also going to be installing Windows 98 on this AMD Athlon XP 1800+. So yeah, like I said, I am going to go into more detail on the hardware side of things on this Intel Pentium 4, as well as on this Athlon XP based build, turning them into fine Windows 98 retro machines. But the focus of this video is to go back to this Gigabyte based ATX tower that I already turned into a Windows 98 machine. So let's go over that one. And we'll start by taking a look at the PC booting and the BIOS. So what we see here is we have an AMI BIOS. We have the 939A8XM BIOS version 1.6. There are newer BIOS versions available, but that's only for supporting newer CPUs. Now, a lot of you have recommended that I take a look at the capacitors on this board in order to fix the dual channel RAM issue that I had with this PC, but that will be a separate video. So for now, I'm just going to focus on the software side of things. We see our AMD Athlon 64 3000 Plus running at 1.8 gigahertz. We have single channel memory mode, 512 megabytes. It has detected our Western digital hard drive and our DVD optical drive. And let's look into the BIOS now. So on the main menu item, we have uh, the same information we see on the post screen. We have some additional information regarding the memory, which is clocked at 166 megahertz. So it's being detected as DDR333. Despite it being a DDR400 stick, if we go into the CPU configuration, we can see that it, everything is auto configured. We have cool and quiet enabled. The multiplier and the voltage is also set to auto, meaning that we have a multiplier of nine, but we can change that and we can also change the voltage to do some overclocking on the CPU. Now, I'm not gonna do that given the nature of the capacitors on this board and the fact that it didn't even support dual channel memory. So I am going to be uh, replacing the capacitors and see if we can overclock it afterwards. But yeah, you have the usual suspects in terms of uh, settings. This motherboard has integrated LAN and audio, so we can enable and configure that. We can set the hyper threading speed with uh, some advanced options. ACPI settings for power on IDE configuration. So I have disabled the SATA controller here because I'm gonna be using uh, IDE drives uh, just to make it a little bit more Windows 98 friendly. Uh, floppy drives installed, Super I.O., so this is everything related to serial, parallel, game ports, MIDI ports, and USB configuration. The hardware monitor shows the CPU temperature and the motherboard temperature, as well as the CPU fan speed. We can configure the boot settings, standard security settings, and that's basically it. Now, the Windows 98 installation went without any issues, so I was able to install it without any hangs or reboots. 
but obviously we do have some work here. It has detected our AMD Athlon 64 processor, but in device manager, we have the standard display adapter. We have no drivers for the ethernet controller, the audio driver and USB. So that's something that we are going to be fixing now. Now I did install Windows 98 on an 80 uh, gigabyte IDE drive. During the installation, it was only detected as a 10 gigabyte hard drive. I think this is a limitation of the FDisk utility, which is on the Windows 98 uh, second edition CD-ROM drive. But after the Windows installation, uh, where it did the formatting, I noticed that it was properly detected as an 80 gigabyte drive. Now, all of the drivers for this motherboard are available for Windows 98, so I have downloaded them uh, onto this uh, hard drive here. So we're gonna start with the uh, LAN driver for some basic uh, networking. So this is just next, next, next finish. Obviously, we need to reboot, uh, as is the case for every driver installation here. So. Here we have Windows building up its driver information database and it has detected our ULI PCI fast ethernet controller. So we don't need to select any drivers here because it has already preloaded the drivers and it's just next, 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 finish. It will copy some files from the Windows 98 CD-ROM. This is mostly related to networking stacks and then we should be good to go. Of course, we need to restart our computer again. After restarting it, it has detected our network controller, but in order to share files, we need to enable file and print sharing. And in order to do that, of course, we need to reboot the computer again. And after that reboot, we can browse the network neighborhood and hopefully we should see our network devices, which is the case here. So that's good. So for those of you who haven't seen the previous video, this PC didn't come with a graphics card. So I picked the first one that I found in a, a big box of graphics card. And what turned up was this MS808039, which is basically a very cheap GeForce 2 MX200. I think this should be sufficient for, you know, playing some of these late 90s games on Windows 98, especially as it is supported by a very beefy CPU. Now to get the card up and running, we need the NVIDIA detonator drivers for Windows 98. I'm going to go with a very early version, version 8.05. And this is an old school installation where we just select the standard PCI graphics adapter, go into the drivers tab, update driver, and then point to the folder which contains the extracted detonator drivers. Afterwards, it has detected the GeForce 2 MX200. It's again building up its infamous driver information database and will no doubt prompt us with a reboot dialog. And after a reboot, we get rewarded with a 16-bit color Windows 98 desktop. And just to verify here, the NVIDIA GeForce 2 MX200 is properly detected. Next up is the audio driver provided by Realtek. So this is the Realtek AC97 Audio, which is a very popular chipset for integrated audio on these types of motherboard. And it has this nice little setup program, which will install the drivers. And of course, at the end, prompt us for a little reboot again. And of course, we need to build our little driver information database again. And afterwards, it will detect all of the various hardware devices related to audio. And after a reboot, we should have some sound video and game controllers installed here, as well as in the system tray here, we have this kind of in your face Realtek audio control panel. I was going to say this is how we designed application in the 90s, but I have a feeling that, you know, most modern gaming PCs have similar layouts for video card tweaking and BIOSes and whatnot. Next up is the USB support. So again, pretty simple setup, PCI to USB enhanced host controller driver, next, next, next finish. So yeah, basically all of these drivers were installed without too many issues. So I have to say that Windows 98 driver support for this motherboard is excellent. 
And how about that? Another building driver information database. We also have an AGP driver that we can install. So this is to give, you know, chipset specific support for the AGP driver. Now it is recommended that we reinstall the Graphy driver. <laughs> Didn't know that a Graphy driver was a thing, but yeah, I'm just gonna have a little faith, I guess. So restarting computer again for the AGP driver. Again, new hardware found, the ALI AGP system controller. Next up, we can install the AMD Cool and Quiet technology. Next, 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 finish. There's also a SATA driver that we can install, although this won't work here because as rightfully said here by the SATA program, the chipset cannot be found and that's because we have disabled the SATA controller here in the BIOS, so we have IDE only. But there's also a Windows 98 driver for the IDE subsystem, so we're gonna go ahead and install that as well. And that should be the last of the drivers that we need to install for Windows 98. Again, a quick restart, and we should have a Windows 98 environment now, which is totally up and running with all of the drivers. So we have video, networking, the SCSI controller I think is from my daemon tools, but we have sound, we have serial and parallel ports, and we have USB support. Now a quick look at the NVIDIA drivers for the GeForce 2 MX200. Things are pretty basic, so we can go in Advanced, hit the GeForce 2 MX tab. We get some display adapter information, 32 megabytes on board, AGP GeForce 2 MX, driver version information. And if we go into additional properties, we have various direct 3D settings. There is no setting to disable the V-Sync, I noticed but there are some uh, options for anti-aliasing and texel and stuff. On the OpenGL tab, there is a vertical sync uh, option that you can uh, turn off, but not for direct 3D. So in order to uh, disable VSync, we need to have a different tool. And you will see the effect of having VSync turned on for direct 3D when you use a tool like 3 Mark 99 now, I've been using 3D Mark 99 a lot for the past couple of weeks on some older, slower PCs for that Windows 98 uh, experience. So I wanted to see how 3D Mark 99 would run on a much faster system like this in Windows 98. And I have to say I was pleasantly surprised even though it has a very low-end graphics card uh, the 3D Mark uh, benchmark went really well. The race uh, benchmark ran really smooth, as well as the first person benchmark. But I did notice that it was kind of maxing out at around 50 frames per second. So that's probably the V sync which is kicking in. So we're going to see what we can do about that and then you know, quickly rerun this benchmark. But just to get an idea of the overall score with VSync enabled, we are getting about 5,173 3D marks. Now to toggle various display settings, I like to use a tool called Riva Tuner or Riva Tuner, which allows you to not only configure the actual hardware device, like the GPU, the core clock and the memory clock, AGP settings and whatnot, but it also allows you to configure various direct 3D and OpenGL settings. Now, the advantage of using a tool like this is that it gives you a lot more settings than what is typically exposed by the standard NVIDIA display driver. So both on Direct 3D and OpenGL, there are a lot of different tweaks that you can uh, you know, manipulate. And, you know, VSync is just one of the things that I wasn't able to find in the standard driver, but I was able to turn off here using Rivet Tuner. 
So let's rerun 3D Mark 99 and we can immediately see at the first benchmark that we get close to 70 FPS and over. So this was something that we weren't able to achieve with the V-Sync on. So you can clearly see here that it hits over 70 FPS. And also in the first person uh, game, we have an excess of 80 to 90 FPS without any issue. And this will obviously dramatically increase our 3D Mark 99 score. So let's take a look at that. 7,300 3D marks and 40,000 CPU marks. So when we compare the 3D mark result with the previous one, we see a big increase. A jump from 5,200 to 7,300 is substantial. And also the CPU 3D mark has increased. So that just goes to show that, you know, making use of a program like Rivet Tuner can increase your overall performance. So let's quickly go into Everest to see what kind of information we can dig up from the computer. So let's go into the summary. So we have our AMD Athlon 64. It has detected our ASRock motherboard, the ULI or ALI chipset, AMD Hammer architecture, AMI BIOS. So yeah, everything properly detected. So yeah, AMD 64, base clock of 200 megahertz, multiplier of nine, giving us 1.8 gigahertz, cache information, CPU ID. So yeah, the motherboard, AMD Hammer architecture, our DDR memory, which according to the BIOS is running at 133 megahertz, but according to this, it's running at 150 uh, megahertz. And again, here we see our 512 megabytes of RAM. We can see the module name here. So um, here it is properly detected as a PC 3200, 200 megahertz. So DDR 400. Here we have some information on the chipset. So we have the North Bridge and the South Bridge from uh, ALI. Some information on the GPU, so MX200, again, pretty low-end card, 64-bit uh, memory bus, but, you know, decent enough to play some uh, late uh, 90s games. And more importantly, you can kind of pick this up for like 5 euros or something, and most likely, if you get yourself an AMD Athlon 64 system, you'll probably have a similar video card already installed and that's the cool thing about this platform is that for about 10 euros you can get uh, a really nice you know windows 98 compatible uh, retro machine that that doesn't cost an arm and a leg a hardware monitor is also a nice tool to get a look at the sensor network included in this machine so we get the voltages of the main board some temperatures the fan speeds as well as the core uh, temperature of the amd athlon 64. so now the time has come to see how our little pc here performs as a windows 98 retro gaming pc like I said before, you can get these kind of systems really, really cheap, if not free. I mean, they provide a pleasant Windows 98 experience as, you know, PCs from this era typically still have very decent Windows 98 driver support. If you pair them up with a cheap GeForce graphics card, you will be able to play all of the games that you used to play on your 3D FX based systems, which would cost you an arm and a leg if you would have to, you know, put together a period correct Windows 98 gaming rig with something like a Voodoo 3 or some other high end card. I mean, this is a very cheap alternative and it does give you a very pleasant gaming experience as it will be able to play you know most if not all of these games from the late 90s early 2000s in a fairly high resolution
Now, Midtown Madness is one of those other really cool games. I think it was released in 1999, so most likely you would run this game on something like a Pentium 3 or something where you would kind of struggle to uh, run this game in high resolutions depending on the graphics card you had obviously but with this geforce 2 mx you have no issue running this at a fairly high resolution 1024 by 768 full detail and the game runs absolutely fine i mean I really like playing these, you know, late 90s games and the fact that you have a really cheap, powerful machine to do it is just really awesome according to me. It just goes to show that you don't always need to target that period correctness and you can just have a lot of fun with a computer like this. If you know how to drive that is. But as you can see here we're hitting 40 plus frames per second. Um, everything is running fine and it's just a blast to play a game like this and the same goes for another classic we have need for speed version 3 here running at 60 plus frames per second high detail really crisp image a joy to play on this machine Another classic is of course Unreal Tournament and this game runs at about, I don't know if Fraps99 is playing tricks on me, but I mean 150 FPS is not bad for Unreal Tournament. Again, a blast to play on a, a PC like this. I really, you know, I really like the fact that, you know, a cheap GeForce 2 MX card, which is highly compatible with most if not all of these games, is able just to, to capture that, that late 90s feeling and you don't need to spend a whole lot of money just to have fun with it. Some early titles might be capped at 30 FPS like this Le Mans 24 hours but still it is a blast to play. You can play it at high resolution, high detail and that's the thing that I really like about these types of machines. I mean they are very compatible with Windows 98. You can get them very cheap either via local listings or, or elsewhere. Sometimes you can even get them for free. You can pair them up with a very cheap GeForce card and you're up and running in no time giving you the opportunity to play lots of cool games from the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. So that being said, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. In the next video, I will be doing a recap of this board to see if I can fix the dual channel memory issue. And I'm also going to be taking a closer look at the Intel Pentium 4 and the Athlon XP just to see how they fare as Windows 98 and do like a quick comparison with this one. I also have a bunch of AGP video cards that I still need to try out, which were donated to me recently. So that might also make for an interesting video. And in the meantime, I really hope you've enjoyed this one. If you did, please consider liking it, subscribing to the channel if you like this kind of retro content. And I hope to see you guys really, really soon. Bye-bye.